Hello, everyone. My name is Zian Kang, and this paper is about the optimal public provision of private goods. So the starting point of this paper is the observation that redistributive programs often have two policy levers. First, the designer might tax or subsidize a good sold in the private market. On the other hand, the designer might alternatively publicly provide the good in the form of a public option. One such example is affordable housing, where local housing authorities might either provide vouchers for folks to rent in the private market or directly provide affordable housing units. There are many other examples, including examples in healthcare and in education. In these settings, many questions arise. For example, we might ask if these policy levers are sufficient or how these policy levers should be structured optimally. In this paper, I answer these questions by analyzing the optimal way to allocate a good via public provision when consumers also have access to a private market. To illustrate the framework, let us consider the example of affordable housing. There is a mass of consumers who can apply for public housing, but in addition to public housing, consumers can also rent in the private market. And like in standard mechanism design, the designer in my setting cannot design the entire market. Instead, she can design only the public option, but not the private market. And so the designer has to determine the equilibrium effects of her design on the private market, as well as vice versa. For example, suppose that the designer runs a, a lottery to allocate the public option for free. Now, without a private market, all consumers will participate in this lottery. But with a private market, this analysis is not as simple. That's because depending on what price uh, the private market, uh, what price is in the private market, consumers may or may not participate in this lottery. This price is determined by the residual demand from consumers who do not receive the public option, but residual demand in turn depends on which consumers participate in this lottery. And so even the analysis of a simple mechanism, namely allocating the public option via lottery for free is subject to a fixed point problem when a private market is present. Perhaps surprisingly, however, this fixed point problem that I just described is tractable and admits a simple solution. The main technical result of this paper is that the designer's optimal mechanism consists of at most three prices. At the high price, consumers receive the public option with certainty. At the medium price, consumers are rationed, by which I mean that they receive the public option with some probability less than one. And at the low price, consumers receive the public option with even lower probability. This is a characterization result, which we can use to study the designer's optimal mechanism in different economic settings. The key insight that the main result relies upon is the observation that the designer can accommodate equilibrium considerations as constraints in the design problem. Thus, the design problem decomposes into two stages. In the first stage, you can think of the designer as designing the optimal mechanism subject to this constraint that the private market clears at some price p. And in the second stage, the designer then optimizes overall such feasible prices p. Now, the second stage is a simple one-dimensional problem over prices. But to solve for the optimal mechanism in the first stage, I use the results of Bauer and Shapiro. These results allow rationing to be viewed as an optimal response to constraints. And because equilibrium considerations are mathematically equivalent to constraints in the design problem, and so rationing of the public option is generally required whenever these constraints or equilibrium considerations bind. Now, this paper is connected to a substantial body of literature, some of which has featured in previous iterations of this conference. As I explained in a few slides, I explicitly build on the framework introduced by Dvokchak, Commoners, and Aquapur in the paper on redistribution through markets. Let me jump directly into the model. The model consists of three separate components, which I will zoom in uh, sequentially. First, there's a unit mass of consumers. Um, second, there's a private market for the good. And finally, there's a public option with which the designer designs. To model inequality among consumers, I build on the framework introduced by Dvokcha, Commoners, and Akpapur. There's a unit mass of consumers who are distinguished along two dimensions. First, the value for quality denoted by theta. And second, the marginal utility for money denoted by V. Consumer utility is additive over the goods quality and money. And in turn, this implies that consumer behavior is entirely determined by each consumer's marginal rate of substitution denoted by R. This is the ratio between theta and V 
um, and we assume that it's distributed according to some well-behaved distribution, f of r. Now we can think of r as each consumer's willingness to pay for the good as uh, in standard mechanism design. Now the designer doesn't observe each consumer's uh, value theta or marginal value for money v. And as Dvokchak, Commoners, and Agbapur show, um, we can rewrite the expected utility of consumers using the law of iterated expectations. So expected utility of each consumer is exactly equal to the weighted Marshallian surplus, where the weight, which I denote by lambda of R here, is equal to the expected value of V, conditional on their willingness to pay R. So this allows us to interpret the designer as maximizing a standard utilitarian welfare function with the Pareto weights of consumers given by lambda of R. Throughout this paper, um, I'm going to be assuming that Pareto weight lambda is decreasing in R. So this means that consumers with higher willingness to pay R tend to have lower marginal utility V for money. Uh, one example, um, which is very simple, is the case where all consumers have the same marginal utility uh, for money. So that V here is identically equal to one. And in this case, lambda is constant. And so um, trivially also decreasing in R. A second example is the case where all consumers have the same value for the goods quality. And so in this case, lambda will be inversely proportional to R and hence also decreasing in R. So let me move on now to the second component of the model, namely the private market. All consumers can access a perfectly competitive private market. Um, the quality of good sold in the private market is normalized to one. And supply in the private market is described by the supply curve S, um, which is continuous and strictly increasing. I'm going to denote producer surplus in the private market by uh, this function W. And by Hotelling's lemma, we can relate producer surplus to the supply curve by observing that the supply curve must be equal to the gradient of the producer surplus function W. Now, the third component of the model um, is the public option. The designer produces a public option at a constant marginal cost of C. Um, and the quality of the public option is delta which I'm going to assume is between zero and one, um, although results extend straightforwardly to the case where delta is more than one. So for instance, if delta is exactly equal to one, then consumers view the public option and the private good as perfect substitutes for each other. And the designer also faces a budget constraint of B. The designer in my setting maximizes total expected utility. And so to be very explicit, this means that the designer maximizes the sum of weighted consumer surplus, producer surplus, and the designer's own profit from supplying the public option. I assume that the designer has a Pareto weight of one, and so she receives one unit of utility for one unit of profit. So for example, when the average Pareto weight on consumers is also one, then consumers have the same value for money as the designer does on average. And in this case, we are back to the standard mechanism design world where any uniform transfer from the designer to all consumers is welfare neutral. And finally, the designer cannot observe individual realizations of consumer types, but knows the distribution F among the consumer population. Now, the timing of the model is as follows. Um, first, consumers who might want to apply for the public option do so. Uh, and then allocations for the public option are realized and consumers who receive the public option then leave the market. After that, the remaining consumers proceed to the private market where the competitive equilibrium is realized. Um, and at the very end, um, all payoffs will be realized. So to set up the mechanism design problem, I denote the allocation function by X, um, which is the probability that a consumer of type theta V gets the public option. Um, and I write the payment function as T which is the expected payment that this consumer makes to the designer. The competitive price in the private market, um, I denote by P, uh, and this depends on the allocation function X. Um, but because the market is large, namely that there is a unit continuum of consumers, uh, individual misreports of theta and V do not affect the price P. So with this notation, the main theorem can now be stated, um, which is to allocate the public option there exists an optimal mechanism such that there are two rationing options or three prices in this mechanism. Um, and I will sketch this proof in three different steps. So first I characterize the relationship between the competitive price P and the allocation function X. Um, after that, I 
characterize incentive compatibility, and finally, I solve for the optimal mechanism. So to begin, let us examine first the relationship between uh, the competitive price P and the allocation function X. An allocation function X affects a price P in the private market if and only if the following market clearing condition is satisfied, namely um, residual demand from consumers who are not allocated the public option but still willing to pay a price of P uh, must be equal to supply at the price P. And um, as I will, I will soon explain, the most important takeaway from this condition is that uh, this expression of the market clearing constraint uh, is an affine functional of the allocation function X. Now, by the revelation principle, we can focus on direct mechanisms in which consumers report their types truthfully. Um, and notice here that the incentive compatibility constraint depends on the equilibrium price in the private market, which in turn depends on the allocation function X. Um, but we can get rid of this nonlinearity by introducing the constraint that the equilibrium price must be equal to P star. Um, and so after we condition on P star, the incentive compatibility constraint uh, will be standard. We can then rewrite the incentive compatibility constraint as a function of the consumer's option value for the public option, normalized by the consumer's marginal value for money. And we refer to this normalized option value as the consumer's effective type, um, which is equal to delta. Delta, again, is the quality of the public option multiplied by consumer's willingness to pay R minus the positive part of the difference between R and P star. Because this um, expression for incentive compatibility resembles the usual incentive compatibility constraint, we can write down the equivalent of Meyerson's lemma in this setting, uh, which explicitly says that any incentive compatible mechanism is essentially equivalent to one in which allocation is increasing in the consumer's effective type, um, while the payment function is given by the usual envelope theorem argument. So at this point, we can already answer the question about who buys the public option. Unlike standard mechanism design, where there is no distortion at the top of uh, the consumer type distribution, here there is no distortion in the middle of the distribution of consumer willingness to pay. This is because consumers' effective types are not monotone in R, as you can see in this plot, uh, but rather go up first um, and peak somewhere in the middle and then uh, subsequently decrease. And so consumers with the middle values of R have the highest effective types. Um, in turn, this implies that consumers with the highest willingness to pay or the richest consumers always buy the private good and never buy the, private, the, the public option. Middle class consumers apply for the public option and if they're not allocated, uh, they buy the private good. And finally, the poorest consumers apply for the public option and leave the market if they're not allocated. Um, finally, let me wrap up the derivation of the main theorem. So by the incentive compatibility constraint, the allocation function must be increasing in effective types. But here, the mechanism must also satisfy the market clearing constraint and the budget balance constraint, both of which are affine in the allocation function X. In the absence of uh, the market clearing and budget balance constraints, it can be shown that the optimal mechanism must be a posted price mechanism. Uh, and this is because posted price mechanisms correspond to the extreme points of the set of all incentive compatible mechanisms. With n different affine constraints, however, uh, the constraint set of mechanisms are going to be convex combinations of at most n plus one different posted price mechanisms. Um, and hence these optimal mechanisms will consist of at most uh, n plus one different prices. Note that the optimal mechanism here must be attained at such an extreme point. Uh, because the designer's problem is an infinite dimensional linear program problem um, in the allocation function. And so in this case, uh, there are two constraints, namely the market clearing constraint and the budget balance constraint. So the optimal mechanism consists of at most three prices. So this concludes the proof sketch of the main result, showing that rationing possibly with up to three different tiers uh, is going to be optimal for allocating the public option. But this result assumes that the designer cannot intervene in the private market. So let me return now to the initial motivation with which I started this talk, um, which posited that there are two policy levers, one of which is intervention in the private market through 
a tax or subsidy, and the other is um, providing the public option, uh, providing the public option in the public market. So what happens if the designer could intervene in the private market via a tax or subsidy? In this case, it turns out that the optimal provision mechanism for the public option would require one fewer rationing option. And intuitively, this is because um, a tax in the private market creates slack in the market clearing constraint. And so the market clearing constraint here never binds. And so only the budget balance constraint could potentially bind here, meaning that one fewer rationing option is required in the optimal provision mechanism. And finally, um, let me close with this question of how this compares to a setting in which the designer could design both the public option and the private market. In fact, if the supply curve in the private market was convex, then the designer can do no better than to tax the private good and provide the public option with a menu of at most two prices. Um, but without convexity, the designer might wish to use more complicated mechanisms to intervene in the private market. I want to conclude this um, talk by saying that the outcome and hence success of any policy depends not only on its direct effects, but also on the indirect effects that obtain only in equilibrium. In this paper, I've provided a trackable framework for analyzing how different ways of allocating a public option can affect the equilibrium competitive price and welfare. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>